Hey, what is up guys and welcome to the KX Podcast, episode 11. Today we're talking about rest and recovery. And this is the first podcast in a while that I've kind of had the mic to myself. I've had a few guests on over the past few podcasts and uh, now I'm just talking to myself again. So, I mean, kind of liberating, you know, I've got the reins, I can take the conversation where I want to, but at the same time, kind of lonely, you know, I, uh, I enjoy the company of talking with people. So anyway, let's get into it. We're talking about rest and recovery today. And we're going to go over a few different subjects. We're going to start off with just kind of defining what rest is, what it means to you. Then we're going to go into some other really important components uh, like fatigue, deload, burnout, you know, stuff like that. And I'll, I'll let you know when we're changing subjects. All right, so let's define rest. So what is rest? So resting is simply just uh, the cease of, of movement or work. So when you're not actively doing something when you're not walking when you're not doing anything uh, resting is just the seizing of all movement now you can rest you know in comparison to what you're already doing so if you're currently being very active in your job you can take a rest by walking around you know if that's less strenuous than what you're currently doing so there's different variations of what rest is but ultimately if you truly want to rest your body you should you know sit down stop moving stop working, whatever. Uh, and, and rest is just as important as being active and training. Because if, if you're, you know, you're only being active and you're only working out, you're not giving rest enough consideration, uh, it can really screw up your body. You can really, you know, it can make you tired. It'll drain your energy eventually. There's a lot of really important reasons as to why you should take rest seriously and not just <laughs> so you have an excuse to be lazy. It's, uh, it's really important for your health. So let's say you work out, um, you know, once in a day, realistically, and it's a one hour workout. Okay. So you go to the gym, you get your one hour work in, you go all out in that gym for one hour and then you come home. Now there are 24 hours in a day and you've just put one hour, one full hour into a workout where you, you know, depending on what intensity you were working at, push your body pretty hard. You know, people work at different intensities, but I'm assuming that you're going to the gym to get a good workout in, so you've uh, you've put in a great amount of intensity. So now you have the rest of your day where you're not working out. Now, there's other factors like what kind of job you have and how active you are outside of the gym, but in the 24-hour day, you spent one hour working out, so you have 23 other hours that you have to account for. So that really, for most people, it comes down to what kind of job you have, you know, if you have a very active job, that will take up a large portion of your day. Uh, if you don't have a very active job, you're sitting a lot, it's a lot easier to get those rest hours in. But those 23 hours are just as important as that one hour, you know. Um, and obviously, within those 23 hours, a lot of those hours you're sleeping. Maybe eight hours of those you're sleeping. Hopefully, you're getting <laughs> enough sleep in that time. But then the rest of the time, where you're not sleeping and you're not working out, that's the time that you really manage for how much you're resting. So let's talk about active resting. So resting is, this is my favorite kind of resting. Uh, so resting, active resting is when you rest with a purpose. So you're not just not doing anything. You're not just being lazy. You're aware that you're resting, right? So after I have a good workout, I come home, I sit down on the couch, you know, maybe have a snack, turn on the TV, and you sit there and you're exhausted and you think about how hard you just worked and it just feels good you know you're resting but like you know that you've earned it right or the next day you're feeling really sore from a workout and you're sitting down and you and you're just thinking about how sore your legs are from the squats the day before but you're you're actively resting and recovering so you know it's not just sitting it's not just being lazy you know it's resting you're recovering so it kind of allows you to enjoy your time off more. Like I know personally that uh, if I have a day off or something, like I like to get my workout in right at the beginning of the day because I feel like I enjoy my rest time so much more because, I don't know, I, it's kind of, this is my own perspective, but I, I kind of hold myself to high standards with my free time. I try and make sure that I'm always being productive and sometimes it's kind of hard for me to sit down and relax because I always kind of feel guilty or I feel like I should be doing something more um, and that's not always necessarily healthy because, you know, you should give yourself time off on your days off. Um, but when I have a workout in, I don't feel bad about it because it's like, 
yeah, you know what? I'm sitting here with a PS4 controller in my hand, but my body needs the rest. And when that's in the back of your mind, I feel like it's a lot easier for me to unwind. It's a lot easier for me to go to bed when the body is, you know, you're just resting and you're recovering and, uh, you know, you're, you know that you just put your body through, you know, hell and it's recovering. And I feel like that's, it's a very satisfying feeling and it helps me not feel <laughs> lazy when I'm not being active. You know, some people think about that. I know I do. So it's this whole concept of uh, earning your rest. So active resting. So you're not being lazy. You're actively resting. You're resting by choice. Okay. So, and I mean, if you think about it that way, the one hour of exercise can really enhance the rest of your day. You know, if you think about it, like you put in that one hour of work and the rest of your day, you're thinking about how you're resting and you're recovering and like you've earned this time off. You've earned maybe eating a little bit extra for lunch or for supper because you're, you need the extra nutrients to recover. And, uh, you know, you enjoy the time you're sitting. I know sometimes like after I have a really intense football practice or really intense gym session, I sit down on the couch and I'm just happy. I'm just happy to sit, you know, I'm just happy to sit there and just know that I put in work and I'm exhausted, but like I've given this exhaustion to myself. I've earned it. So, and you know, sometimes that one hour in the gym gives you a good energy boost for the rest of the day. You know, I've talked to a lot of people. That's the case. You just have more energy in the day. So putting in that one hour in the gym can really just enhance the rest of your day, whether you're being active or not being active. Um, it can do a lot for you. So moving on to the next subject, let's talk about fatigue. Okay. So Fatigue is something that your body will accumulate over time. And this is something that not a lot of people know about. And it's something that I didn't really know about. Um, I, I've just been learning more and more about fatigue and how it works over the past year. So you kind of know by definition fatigue, you know, you're fatigued. It just sounds like you're, you're tired, you're exhausted. But fatigue is something that you accumulate over time based on how active you are, based on what you're doing, and also based on how used you are to the activities that you're doing. So naturally, the more strenuous the activity you're doing, the more fatigue you're going to have. And if you're not very active in your days or you don't really work out, you're not going to have a lot of fatigue. You will accumulate very little amount of fa fatigue, which makes, you know, you don't have to really worry about it. But the more fatigue you have, the more you have to consider how you manage your time off, the more you have to consider how you're resting. So if you have a really active job and... Uh, I don't know what you're doing, but you say you're on your feet a lot. Maybe you're carrying heavy things now and then. Um, you really, you have your evenings and your weekends to rest and recover. So you should consider that you might need that evening and that weekend very badly to recover from the day's work that you do. You may get used to it, so your fatigue growth may be less, but the fatigue's still going to be there. So I would utilize those evenings and weekends to rest. Now that becomes an even bigger challenge when you're working out. So you put in an eight hour day and then you go to the gym, you know, that's your, and in, in the gym. So look at it this way. Okay. If you're work, you have an active job, you kind of get tired as the day goes along. You know, it's not like you're going at a hundred percent intensity every minute of the day. You might be active for 20 minutes of that every hour, or you might be lifting things that are kind of heavy, maybe take 60% of your max energy to lift something, but you do it a lot, right? So you're never really pushing yourself all out. So you look at like one hour in the gym compared to maybe a six hour shift and the one hour in the gym, you're going to accumulate a lot more fatigue than an entire eight hour day because of how hard you're pushing yourself, right? So from that one hour alone, you're going to need a lot of rest time. You know, you, now you add an eight hour day to it, you should really be considering your rest time, I guess. You know, this is something that athletes often have to deal with because, you know, if you're an athlete, you put in an eight-hour day and then you have to be athletic outside of that. So, I mean, I know a lot of people that I've played football with, they put in an eight-hour day of labor and then they come to football practice and they grind out for like two to three hours and then they go to bed and then they do it again the next day. And it's just super exhausting. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a difficult place when you're in that situation because there's not a whole lot you can do aside from maybe just really making sure you rest on the weekends and then of course making sure you get a full night's sleep so yeah it kind of sucks that if you like for ex that that uh, athlete example if you put in a full day and then your evening is spent working out or you know on the field put
putting in some work. That's just kind of the your the situation of life that you're in. So you're just going to have to really put some importance on sleep because you need sleep for recovery. Ultimately, you need it so much. And you're just going to have to get through this period of your life uh, knowing that you might not be able to go out and do as many things because you need to recover. And you always have the weekends, right? So for depending on what kind of workout you're doing, so switching back to the topic of working out, um, you often will need one recovery day for one workout day. That's a, that's a good general rule. Um, but if you're kind of on uh, a bro split or a body split or whatever you want to call it, like a, where you work one muscle group a day, you can kind of manage that a little bit easier. So let's say you do a chest down Monday, a back down Tuesday, leg down Wednesday, etc. Um, it's easy to manage your rest because you're working only one muscle group for one day. You isolate it. And then let's say you work out another four or five days that week, but you haven't isolated your chest since, let's say, Monday. So by the time next Monday comes around, your chest has had already a week to recover, even though you've only you've you've worked out another four or five days after that day. So you can kind of get away with that if you're doing a split like that. But if you're doing like a full body workout or workouts where you do a lot of uh, compound moving, so you're getting a lot of joints involved. So like, uh, let's say like a squat, for example, or a deadlift or an overhead press or a clean and clean and press, whatever it is, like where you're doing your whole body's engaged in the exercise, you might need a day off in between your workouts because you're using so much more of your body, using so much more of your muscles, and the rest day becomes really important. Whereas you're doing a bro split, you can kind of get away with using a lot of, uh, you know, spacing it out to your advantage. So depending on how trained you are, like how used you are to your routine, how used you are to your lifestyle, um, like I mentioned earlier, your fatigue does become less as you become accustomed. But by nature of progressive overload, you're always challenging yourself to more and more weight. So you don't really, depending on your workout program, it's hard to get used to it And when you're always challenging yourself to lift more and more weight. So you should always be considering uh, how your fatigue is growing within you. So um, something that I think we should talk about and because recent studies are, are mostly done on people training to f- fatigue or, or failure. I mean, um, anytime you push yourself to failure, so you, you do as many burpees as you can until you can't. As many push-ups until you quit. You do as many reps on the bench until you can't do a single single one more. That is going to accumulate the most fatigue of anything else you do. Because not only are you pushing yourself your absolute hardest, you're pushing yourself to failure that accumulates a lot of fatigue because your body has to has to bounce back from a place of complete failure, rock bottom, right? That takes a lot of time. So, I don't really recommend training to failure unless, you know, you you've you've planned it into your workout, it's not sporadic, you've you've uh, accounted for the rest time you're going to need for it, then fine. You know, if you're going for a PR, same thing. You're going for just one rep of the highest weight you've ever lifted, lifted, that's going to uh, create a lot of fatigue in your body. So it's the same thing as doing, you know, you fail at push-ups at rep 27 and you collapse to the ground. It's the same as doing one rep all out on the bench because the fatigue that you're creating is, is the same even though the volume is different. But volume is also something you should consider <laughs> for fatigue. Because volume ultimately is fatigue, right? Because fatigue is gathered over time. It's gathered over the volume of what you do. So volume can easily be managed in the gym because you can count out how many reps, how many sets. But the volume of work you do is, you know, it occurs outside the gym as well. It's how many times you picked up that box at work. Maybe the, the intensity is a little bit less, but the volume is still great over time. So um, I think that we've probably talked fatigue as much as we have to. So let's move on to deloading. Deloading is what you do to combat fatigue. So it's kind of how you can undo fatigue. So fatigue is gathered over time. Deloading, um, it gets rid of the fatigue over time. So if you work out every single week, you should make sure that you take a week off every now and then. You know, some people have different endurance, and it definitely depends what kind of training you do, but you should take some time off 
to let your body bounce back, to let it kind of re-energize and to just get the fatigue levels down. So, so a lot of people can't make progress anymore. They stall out, they can't add any weight. That's because they've gone so far that they're lifting what they normally lift, but their fatigue is so high that their body just can't keep up. You know, I don't care how much of a tough guy you think you are, but you need rest just like everybody else. So if you're bodybuilding and, and you've been going for three months straight and you feel like you're going to die, but you got to be there, it might be to your advantage to take a day off because sometimes you come back and you feel better than you did before. You feel stronger. You can lift more weight because of the time off. You know, deloads are, are really weird that way. And I'm still learning about them and how they work. But, for example, I strength train. And I work out usually, typically four days a week. And I will work out for three weeks. Uh, each week is more intense than the last week. And then the fourth week I take off. So one week a month, I have a deload week. And sorry, I don't take the time off. That's different from a deload week. A deload week, you're still working out, you're just kind of, you dial down the intensity, you dial down the volume, it's just kind of an, it's like an easy version of your workout. It's kind of like the same workout, it's just the easy version. So you're not lifting as much weight, you're not lifting as, you're not doing as many sets. Um, and even though you're still working out on that time that you're supposedly resting, you're still bringing your fatigue down because your body is used to so much more. So that's just me. I've talked to people that they deload every two months or they deload whatever. It depends on what kind of program you're doing. And it also depends on you and how you you gather your fatigue. So, for example, deloading could be maybe taking a vacation from your job, you know, taking a couple weeks off to deload, to, to de-stress, to get, bring all that fatigue down. But unfortunately, so many people, um, they, they bank everything on you know, a couple weeks off in the winter, a couple weeks off in the summer. And it's not like I'm telling you like, oh, you should take weeks off more. I just mean that it's not like one week off in the summer is going to account for the entire rest of the year. So you shouldn't lean on, you know, like random vacations or days off. You should know that every weekend is important. Every evening is important. I'm not saying that you shouldn't go out and do fun things in the evenings and the weekends. You should just Consider the rest that you might need if you've had a really hard week. Maybe you should do some really hard resting, right? If you work hard, you should rest equally as hard. All right, let's move on to the next subject. And I want to talk about recovery uh, itself just for a little bit here. So we're going to go kind of into some basic anatomy stuff, but I think it's important for you to know. So recovery, your muscles must recover, right? So this is a little bit different than the fatigue I was just talking about. Fatigue kind of is just overall through your whole body, your nervous system, your muscles, everything. But muscle uh, recovery specifically can take a day, you know, one to two days, 24 to 48 hours, depending on your workout and how used to your workout you are. So if it's your first time in the gym after a long time and you get a good workout and you're sore the next day, uh, you've created micro tears in your muscle in the gym and they're sore because they're recovering the next day. Because you, you've literally torn your muscle and it hurts and it has to recover. But it's only that first day where your DOMS, your delayed onset muscle soreness, is really bad and it really hurts. But as you continue to work out, you don't tear the muscles as much. They don't need to be torn as much. Uh, you get used to the workloads. So DOMS over time can, you know, it's not as bad. But if you're bodybuilding... You, you may be familiar with the term of muscular confusion or muscle shocking when you pick different workouts all the time to make sure that your body doesn't ever get used to it. And that can be good for muscle growth because muscle growth ultimately can occur when you tear the muscle down and build the back up stronger. But you will experience DOMS a lot more this way. So this kind of creates this myth that DOMS equals a good workout. You need to feel sore you didn't have a good workout. That's not necessarily true. Um, if you don't experience DOMS anymore, it's probably a good thing. It means that you're into your routine, your body is used to having these workouts, and you can still get stronger and build your muscle without feeling the, the pain the next day. That's, that's a bit of a, a rumor. It's a bit of a bodybuilding myth. Though they do kind of go hand in hand sometimes, especially if you're trying a new thing or testing out a new exercise. Yeah, so an important part of muscle recovery is protein synthesis. So... Protein, protein synthesis 
is something that is always happening. It's kind of the, the breakdown and the buildup of your muscle, but it's this constant flow of, let me put it this way, imagine like a brick wall, and this brick wall is your muscle, okay? So all the different bricks in this wall are amino acids. These amino acids are being broken down and adding back into the wall over and over and over. It's a cycle. It's like a balanced scale. So when you work out, you tip the scale in favor of muscle protein breakdown. Okay, so you're breaking down the wall. But then you want to build it back up with more amino acids. So that's kind of what protein muscle synthesis does is that it rebuilds the wall. So when you break it down really hard, it builds back bigger and it builds back stronger. So the point is that if you put a lot of time and emphasis into breaking down your wall, you should put an equal amount of time or more into building it back up stronger. Okay, this is what recovery is. And, you know, we could kind of go into this whole subject of nutrition, but ultimately what you need to know is that amino acids, you know, you get those with eating protein, consuming protein. So just make sure that you're consuming protein and that you don't want your scale to be tipped in the favor of muscle breakdown for very long. You want to tip it back into the favor of synthesis and then kind of back to normal when it's running its normal routine. At least this is kind of my understanding. It's kind of a basic understanding of, of protein synthesis. You might talk to somebody else who gives you a more complex answer, but this is kind of how I understand it in my mind. It's this process that's always happening and it's either uh, in a deficit or in a surplus. You know, one might exceed the other at certain times of the day and how you control that is kind of with resting and consuming enough protein for your muscles to recover. That being said, you can really hinder your progress if you don't consider recovery time. If you don't ever let your wall build back up strong, then you're just gonna have a broken wall. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, it's awesome if you're a beast in the gym and you're a beast on uh, wherever you're working, picking up heavy boxes and stuff, but like, you're gonna break down or you're gonna start making stop making progress, you're gonna start stalling if you don't give yourself time to rest and recover. You know, it's it's a perfect balance of breakdown and build back up. It's you know, it's black and white night and day. You need to have rest time if you're gonna have work time. So you should plan out your rest days, you know? It shouldn't be just like random, like, oh I don't know, I'm just gonna to go to the gym if I feel like it. I'm just gonna take this day off if I feel like it. You should plan it out. In my calendar I plan out my work days based on my rest days. So I know when I can go to the gym, when I can rest, when is the best time for me to rest. And I plan my rest days, just like I plan my workout days because they're just as important. You should always plan out your rest time accordingly. Now, if you're doing a bodybuilding type thing and you're, you're doing a split, it's kind of like I mentioned earlier, you can kind of uh, count on the time off that you're giving your muscles when you're working other muscles. But even then, you're still working out every day. You're still accumulating fatigue. Just because you're resting on a certain muscle group doesn't mean your, your nervous system isn't accumulating fatigue. So no matter what you're doing, you need to consider resting. Your rest day is taking some time off. So just kind of so you can visualize what's going on in your body, uh, protein synthesis is happening immediately after your workout. So there's, there's really, it's kind of a myth to say that there's an anabolic window that you have to hit. If you don't have a protein shake within an hour of your workout, you've missed the window. It's not really true because there's no certain hour that's super critical because it's kind of a broad window. You kind of have, the you have if you're working out at, let's say, 5 o'clock, you've got the rest of your day. Like, don't don't worry about it. You, it's, it's a very broad window. You have a lot of hours before you kind of miss that ideal time to build your wall back up. So that's protein synthesis, but ultimately muscle recovery takes a little bit longer. That can take a full day, it can take one to two days. And then if you look at fatigue, fatigue can take more than that. Fatigue can take a few days, it can take a week. It depends on how much fatigue you've accumulated over time. So while you're considering your muscle recovery and you're considering how much protein you're taking in, you should also consider the fatigue, okay? It's just as important because you know, you can have all the protein in the world, but if your body doesn't have the energy, it doesn't have the energy. So let's move on to the next subject, sleep. So sleep is one of the most important factors in health. It's, in fact, almost more important than anything else. I've, I've seen some, uh, some, some studies and some research that suggests that sleep is, is more important than re really anything else in terms of recovery and overall health. Because if you don't sleep, 
your body doesn't have that time to recover and re-energize and get all systems back online to 100% by the next day. It'll screw you up, right? It'll screw up your hormones. It'll screw up your attitude, your mindset. It'll screw up your focus. It'll screw up how your digestion works. It'll screw up how you think. All of these things all come down to sleep. So you can have the best routine ever. You can have the best food ever. But if you're having five hours of sleep a day, it doesn't matter, right? So it's it's important and it's easily neglected. I know I've neglected sleep. I kind of have had this perspective on sleep that it's kind of annoying. It's kind of, I feel like I could be more productive or I could be doing something more fun, you know. But I, I've really started to, to emphasize it more in my life. And I have noticed a bit of a difference than how I used to live. I used to have to take a couple naps a day. Nothing wrong with naps, but when I started have t- like having eight hour sleeps, I didn't need to nap as much obviously depending on what I'm doing in that day but kind of what I've done to make sure that I get an eight hour sleep and this depends on if you work in the morning obviously but no matter when I go to bed I give myself eight hours so it's not like oh I, it's it's two in the morning I'll just uh I still gotta get up at, at 8 a.m to maintain my regular routine I've been forcing myself to think nope Eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, because I know it's really important to my recovery. But at the same time, that strategy isn't the best either because routine is really important. And that can be really good for you too. But it's just not as important as getting enough sleep, right? So ideally, you want to have a good amount of sleep and you want to have a good routine. So, um, you know, I have a time of the day I like to go to bed. I have a time of day that I like to wake up. And depending on when I'm working, I try and always hit that time. So... Just, you know, you'll you'll figure out your own little tricks as to how you get a full night's sleep. And it's different for everybody. Like, some people are good off a six-hour sleep. Some people are good off a seven, eight. It just kind of depends on you and what you're used to and where you're at in your life. And also, you know, how old you are. Because depending on how old you are, depends on how much sleep that you're going to need. So, moving on, um, let's talk about the quality of sleep. Okay, so we know that the length, the volume of sleep you're getting is important. Um, but why and, and how you sleep does matter too. So the quality of sleep. So we're talking uh, the different stages of REM, your, your sleep cycles. So you want to make sure that you get into a deep sleep every night. Because if you need that deepest state of sleep, I believe that's stage four of the REM cycle, uh, one of four stages. And in that stage, you will get the most recovery. Your body kind of shuts down everything. You're like So if you're like in your early stage of REM, uh, it's kind of like when your computer's in sleep mode. It's like off, you're kind of starting to recharge a little bit, but you move the mouse and it quickly wakes back up. That's kind of like the first stage of REM. So it, and then the fourth stage is like computer's off, you know. It's not a great analogy because it's not like your computer's recovering every night, but just so you kind of get the idea, you need to get to that certain stage. So if you only get to stage three every night because you're only sleeping, you know, X amount of hours, you're not going to feel as good the next day. You're not going to feel as good as you could have. You're not going to get as much recovery as you could have if you never allowed yourself to get into a deep state of sleep. So let's talk about naps. Naps are good. I, I used to nap every single day. I needed to nap every single day. Granted, I was also getting up early for school. And, you know, if you've ever been a student and you're trying to catch at 8.30 class, that is rough getting up, getting on the bus. You know, I would, I would have like two naps a day. You know, and that's that's fine because that worked for me. It got me through my days, but it doesn't equate to having a deep sleep at night. Um, but naps are really good for re-energizing. And if you're going to have a nap, I think the ideal time to have a nap is, uh, I think the number was between 20 and 30 minutes because it allows you to get into a stage of sleep that lets you uh, kind of rest and recover and re-energize. But if you get too into too deep of a sleep for a nap, it will kind of screw you up. You'll wake up, you'll feel disoriented, you'll feel groggy because your body's like, well, what the hell? Like, we still, still got another seven hours to go. Like, why are you waking up now? But if you only sleep for maybe 20, 30 minutes, you'll have a lot easier time waking up because you didn't enter such a deep stage of sleep. So naps are great and you're going to find what works best for you. So if you're going to need to have a nap, a lot of people do. You know, I usually get tired in the late afternoon. I kind of wish I could have a nap or, you know, right after supper. Then do that if that works for you. And then you have energy for the evening. 
and you know you have early mornings like you're gonna find whatever works for you so there's no best way I'm not gonna say an eight hours sleep and not napping is better than a six hour sleep and having a nap you know just consider the amount of sleep that you're getting and if you're gonna have a nap try and make sure that you're having a, a good quality nap so you're not kind of wasting your time and waking up feeling uh, tired another thing you should consider when you're sleeping is how bright your room is because you'll fall asleep and you'll have a full night's sleep but the quality of your sleep won't be as good if your room is bright it's just it's as simple as that your body has light receptors all over it I didn't even know this until I was listening to some podcasts where some expert on sleep was talking about sleep and he was saying that uh, there were studies done where someone was sleeping but a light was placed under their leg under their knee and that person was had a worse quality of sleep because of the light on the back of their leg so your body is very sensitive to light it needs to be because that's how we stay in tune with the Sun so if there's light coming into your room you're gonna stop producing as many um, you know as much melatonin as you need to you know melatonin is, is a hormone that you produce that lets your body go to sleep and how much light is in the room is gonna affect that and also, just while we're on the subject, you're probably familiar with blue light and technology. And that's kind of a lot of new technology it has this uh, this color that emits from it that you can't really tell. It's like this blue, bluish light, a bluish glow that will prevent melatonin from being produced. So a lot of new phones, you can probably find it in your settings, have a blue light filter. So, um, I mean, just consider how much tech you're using before you go to bed. If you've got your phone in your face right before you fall asleep, it's going to be hard to fall asleep because your body... Uh, it's not going to produce melatonin for at least, you know, 30 to 60 minutes after you put your phone down, you know, and, and depending on how long you were on your TV or your phone or your computer, well, like how long you were doing that will affect how long it takes for melatonin to be produced again. So just so you're aware, you should think about it. Um, I just wanted to talk quickly about eye masks. My My wife bought me an eye mask kind of like as a kind of like, like a silly thing it says airplane mode on it you know it's kind of goofy but uh, I ended up using it and I started using it every single day because we we're on the third floor of an apartment and we have a street light right by our window and it shines the light into our room and we have blinds but the room is never totally dark you know like it's dark but it's not that dark you can kind of get used to the darkness you can see where you're going it's not dark enough the eye mask totally blacks out my my vision I can't see anything and my sleep quality has gone up so much I don't wake up and feel like I need to have a nap I feel like my quality of sleep was so good so if you sleep in a bright room I would recommend an eye mask honestly it's kind of silly when you look at someone in an eye mask but you'll thank me when you wake up and you feel rested so ultimately you'll find what works best for you we're almost done the podcast there's a couple subjects I just want to touch on and then we will wrap up so one thing that we should talk about, uh, and it's kind of in lines with fatigue and, and recovery and all this, is burnout. So burnout or burning out is when you have unbalanced your work and your rest in favor of work. So you're working too much, you're not resting enough, you will burn out. And this kind of applies to all realms of health, not just like physically. This can affect you mentally. This can affect you emotionally. This can affect you spiritually. It can affect you on all these different realms. If you are unbalanced in what activities you do and how much time you spend away from those activities so for example you work out in the gym too much you work out seven days a week you're in there for two hours you want your goals and you want to achieve them so badly but you've not considered rest as an important thing and you will burn out so you will start losing strength you'll lose stamina your fatigue is through the roof your muscles just can't work as efficiently as they could your nervous system is shot you know, that's called overtraining. You've probably heard of overtraining. Some people think it's a myth. Uh, I think those with those people who say, there's no such thing as overtraining, what they're just trying to say is that you're probably not training hard enough. Uh, you know, you can rest a lot. You can work out a lot. You should just consider your rest. And most people could honestly afford to work harder in the gym. So, uh, you know, if you ever hear someone say, oh, there's no such thing as overtraining, you know they probably just mean that you should work harder because there's definitely a thing as overtraining i've seen it people in the gym every single day 
and you see them walking in the gym. Like I'm a staff, you know, I see a lot of people come and go in the gym and I see the people that are there every day for hours and they're drained and they're tired and I just feel bad for them. I just say like, just go home and have a nap, you know, like, you know, consider, consider the rest, man. You don't got to go in here and be a beast three hours a day. So you're gonna, you're gonna overtrain and you're gonna burn out. And I, I notice also like as a student, when you're in classes all the time and you come home from school and you study all evening, it's kind of the same as like putting in an eight hour of laborious work and then coming home and then going to the gym for three hours. It's just like the physical versus the mental, the cognitive, right? You're still going to burn out from all the, the books. So you need to rest your eyes from studying. It depends what you're doing, man. Like, like, I don't know, like probably in all the different realms, like art, music, whatever you're doing, you'll probably burn out no matter what you do if you don't balance out rest time with it. So, I mean, burnout is always something you should try to avoid because if you hit burnout, you know, you've hit the fatigue, like I mentioned earlier, you've probably hit rock bottom and it's hard for your body to bounce back from that. Just like if you're training to failure, it's hard to bounce back from that if you've hit burnout. So you always kind of want to avoid it. And, at all, you know, at all costs, because it's really hard to come back from it. So that's why you should do things like taking rest days and deloads, because it, it keeps burnout at bay. So you have a lot easier time recovering, and you recover at a much faster rate if you're recovering accordingly. And when you need it, and not just waiting until, like, you work out every single week until you're just dead, and you're like, oh, you know what, I should probably take a week off. But then it's like, it's too late, you know, you've already hit burnout. So you should, you should take that time off. You should in advance. So don't wait for your body to start breaking down to realize that you need a break. You should almost take it kind of right on the edge or like before you might even need a break because sometimes your, your brain isn't connected to your body. It's not, again, it's working against you because all you want is gains and, and, and it, you get that gains filter on and you forget about rest. So you should plan for it and do it. Whether you feel like resting or not, you probably need the rest. And the last subject that I wanted to talk about today is something, I don't know if it's a science, I don't know if it's real. This is kind of actually my perspective. I just wanna talk about it because I feel like it's real and I feel like eh, it makes a lot of sense to me and I think a lot of people might relate to this. So I don't know if it has a name yet. I kind of wrote, wrote it down on my paper as rebound. Um, I think that's probably a good name for it. Studies might be out there already. I don't know. Shut up, Zach. Get to the point. Um, <laughs> um, so the idea behind rebound is that if you go so hard in one direction for so long, I think because we live in a balanced universe and because there's always a night and a day and a black and a white, that uh, rebound will happen if you go full tilt in one direction and you don't ever go the other way. So, for example... You work really hard physically all day, you never rest. There's going to be, boom, there's going to be that rebound. So no matter how hard you work, you know, that burnout's going to come or that rebound is going to be there. So when the rebound happens, uh, it's not going to be up to you. Your body's going to go into this rebound mode where it decides that, you know what, it is time that we take a break. It's time for you to stop. You've done this long enough and your body's going to create this rebound in whatever way that it has to. So, um, for example, I've been a student for the past five years, obviously not including high school, but in university, the past five years. And, you know, so much time in classes, so much time studying, so much time doing homework, writing papers, stuff like that, that that was kind of my life, you know, it's your time off. Uh, obviously, like, I'm like every other student and I, I procrastinate and you know, I, I spent time doing other things when I should have been studying, but still, you know, it dominates your schedule. And I was doing that for so long, and then I finally graduated just recently, and then I felt I feel like I was so much more productive when I was a student. Like I had all when I had time off, which was rare, I would spend it being productive. It's like, oh, I have an hour to kill. Like I could play PS4, but I could also like clean up a bit, or I could, you know, start meal prepping, or I I don't know. But I would look for something to do. Oh, I'll hang these pictures up. I've been meaning to hang up on the wall. And I would just give myself these tasks. And now that I'm not a student and I have more free time, I don't have that productivity because I think that I've rebounded. It's like, Zach, you've been going full tilt for so long. 
it is time for you to rest. So I feel like there's just been so many days where I've just kind of been sitting around and I've just been like, I don't want to do anything. I don't even want to, like, I don't want to watch TV. I don't want to do anything. I just want to sit here. So I, I think that there's this, is this natural way of tilting the scale back where your body kind of um, rejects the norm and it's it forces you to go into a state that you need. So this is obviously my perspective. This is my theory, but I feel like it makes a lot of sense. You know, if, if you if you don't ever go the other way, you're so tilt in one direction, I think that it's going to bounce back. And unfortunately, I think that it will bounce back um, in ways that you probably won't like. I think that, um, and you know, obviously, I, uh, I follow Elliot Hulse, and, and he engages this idea a lot, that your body will um, get injured if it's trying to take a break. And that's obviously just it's just a theory, just an idea. And obviously there's like how much you stretch and how much, you know, you recover like and take uh, preventative measures to preventing injuries from happening. But sometimes, you know, the body will just make that rest happen. Boom, injury, time to rest. It's kind of like the universe's way of telling you to take a break. I've seen this happen to people before. And I'm sure that there's obviously other factors in play, but, you know, it might be just the world's way, universe, your body, whatever it is, you know, trying to get you to take a break. Because you're not going to take a break. If you were going to take a break, you would have by now. So it's kind of like when you uh, you go unconscious or like, let's say you're you're drinking really hard one night and you black out. You When you black out, it's your body's way of saying, all right. This guy's not going to stop drinking. He keeps drinking. We're going to die. And then you're like, your your body literally hits an off switch and you black out. It's a preventative measure to keep you alive, right? And so your body can start processing the alcohol so you don't just keep drinking until you die and get alcohol poisoning. So I think that this is kind of like a similar way. It's like a self-defense mechanism where your body can bounce back. So I, I feel like, you know, it could be impaired joints. It could be... Uh, your nervous system, your digestive system, your immune system, I don't, like it could be something that whatever it takes for your body to be like, okay, this guy's not stopping. We need him to take a break. So, you know, it might be, I don't know. I could come up with examples all day, but I, you probably get the idea. So, I mean, Elliot Hulls always talks about how it's kind of seasonal. You can't have summer all year without a winter, right? Or the planet will burn. There, there has to be this balance between work and play, work and rest, um, because you can't, you can't have one season without the other seasons. Every season is important. I remember Elliot Halls was saying that um, he spent years making YouTube videos every single day, working out, you know, all the time, putting on a good performance, lifting heavy weights, and then eventually he just burned out and he went off the grid for like a full year, you know, just nothing. And he said that he was. Uh, he was in summer for too long. He needed to find his winter. So he spent like a year not lifting weights, not doing anything, just doing yoga and stretching and like everything that he had neglected. And, uh, you know, it was his it was his rebound. It was his body's way of bouncing back. So I think that he's, he's very in tune with his body. So I think that uh, he's a very wise guy to recognize this. You could chalk it up to just like, I don't know you want it to change up your routine or you're lazy or whatever you can call it whatever you want but i think that it's you're you're coming from a pretty intelligent place if you're recognizing that you need a break and you take that time that you need to balance out your life if you go so full in one direction all the time you're gonna need to balance the scales eventually so um i guess ultimately the point of this podcast as usual comes down to balance you need to balance out your work you need to balance out your rest rest is important And, uh, yeah, you know what? I think that's where I'm going to wrap up this podcast. I've been talking for a long time. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, This has been Podcast 11. I've still got um, one or two guests lined up for the future, but there may be some more podcasts where it's just me talking. You know, we'll see. So I, I hope you guys have been enjoying these podcasts. Leave a like if you did. Be sure to catch the other ones if you haven't. Klaus next out.